Well, welcome to everyone here in uh, in uh, Lunne at uh, Digitalen. Uh, very well uh, received, uh, and a very well warm welcome to everyone. I'm very happy to see so many people of you um, uh, uh, able to uh, to visit Lumen because it's uh, most of the time we are uh, very centralized around uh, Brussels. Um, uh, we have still some people that uh, that we are expecting, but uh, we didn't want to wait any longer. So I like to uh, hand over the mic to uh, Digitalum. Uh, for their first presentation on this uh, sixth meetup of 2019. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, yeah, I'm going to start with a, a small introduction about Digitalum. Um, I guess not all of you know about Digitalum yet. Um, and then after the introduction, I'll hand it over to an actual expert on the subject. Um, so. This is about the security measurements in AEM. So um, some of you also went to ADAPT2 in Berlin. This is where the subject came to mind. Uh, Dylan went to Berlin and saw a presentation and he dug into the subject a little bit deeper and that's how we got into this uh, meeting. Um, so after Dylan came back from the, the summit in Berlin, um, we took a little bit more of a deep dive into the subject of, let's say, hacking AEM. Um, it's not really hacking AEM, but it's, it's just checking the security measurements around the solution. Um, and after only a few minutes, we came up with some, well, astonishing um, topics where we were able to, without actually doing it, of course, delete uh, live production environments, um, look at admin passwords for a production environment and so on. So that's why we came up with um, this meetup topic that it would be interesting for everyone to know on how to make the proper security measurements around AEM. So with Zigitalum, so e-commerce strategy and development agency uh, focusing on the high-end e-commerce and CX solutions. In this case for us it's the Adobe Experience Cloud and the SAP Commerce Cloud. Um, we started, at least, well, I started a little bit more than a year ago with, as part of the Continuum Consulting Group here. Um, we became our own year, so we're now 12 employees, a couple of contractors, and, uh, well, we do have some large customers already after, um, let's say, a, a small start. So, a little bit of Digitalum DNA. Um, a few people here already worked for me with me when I was at Bose, and I hope they can acknowledge that, well, for me it's important to, be, to have fun at the job, and also think a little bit different, not just be the same as everyone else, and that's why we have the Joker as our logo, as, our, um, as the thing that we chose. Um, it's a, it's a important card and that's why we chose it as well. Um, we're already SAP silver partner and uh, Adobe bronze partner during the first year, which is already pretty good if we, when we think about it. Um, short disclaimer. So we say hacking AEM. It's not really hacking AEM. It's the security measures around it. So Adobe is a clear leader in the content management solution uh, space. And it's just how do you make sure that if you work with such a, a large product, uh, which can do so much, that you don't open doors that need to be shut from the outside. So even a top class platform does not want to deploy with all the necessary configurations and all the security measurements that you need. Human intervention is always needed, and that's what this presentation is aimed for. Um, why was it so important for us? Well, for us, it's, it's a core business, is the AEM, and it's the responsibility towards our customers that well, they deliver a safe environment that you, for instance, can't just delete their um, online presence. Also, our market trend, um, we see a lot more security measurements that need to be in place, a lot more um, people that try to break into your systems. Uh, we already saw it with the, um, the delegation in China, which we had 
think 100 attacks per hour on the delegation, so it's it's a hot topic. And also, well, because you have those digital customer experience projects, you have a lot of data to drive the personalization, but data is important for hackers and can even be sold for the right amount of price. So focus on functionality, but what about the non-functional requirements? So you can develop the best platform, you can deploy whatever you want, if the non-functionals aren't there and you're not focusing on that as well, then your platform will be open for hacking or security issues. Well, why the threat is real? Some, some uh, articles from, I think, the last couple of months. We have big companies um, having data leaks and so on. Uh, we also have the GDPR, which is making it, making it a lot more visible that companies have data leaks. Um, so that's why it's real. Also, well, in, in our local um, companies, Orange and, and Tomorrowland. So it's not that you just target the really big international companies. They'll also go for local uh, customer data. I got an email last week from Edenred for the meal vouchers. Mm -hmm. They had a data leak and they used to inform me that that happened. Yep. Thanks to GDPR. Yep, well, thanks, yeah. Um, and I think this is also something I already learned, didn't learn as when I was a developer in the past, but when I learned as a manager that there are a lot more things to just developing code, that the impact to the business can be huge and very significant. If you lose data, you can lose um, a lot of things because of your be, you being hacked, of you having a data leak. Um, it's cost of compensation and, and, and the reputation for the brand. I think that's the most important thing these days is the brand reputation. Um, for major brands, it's, it's, it's a huge impact to their brand recognition. Um, so make sure to place e-commerce security at the top of your agenda when implementing these platforms. It's not just on the Adobe platform, it's with every single uh, content management or e-commerce system which has connectivity to the outside world let's say um, so Dylan will be the speaker for this uh, topic so a certified AM developer and architect worked on previous uh, various uh, AM implementations is now uh, starting a new project at Bose and uh, well he dove into the matter and he's uh, very into the the security of the the AEM platforms. So I'm giving the word to him. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, first of all, before we start, um, I'd like to ask who of you went to Adapt2 this year in Berlin? Not a lot of people, I guess. So um, the reason why that we started this is because um, at Adapt2 there was a talk about AEM security. Um, and how, how uh, the presenter at the time was a professional hacker um, and how he exploited several bugs. And what we want to do today is not go into those topics again because he gave, gave us the problems, but we want to talk about the potential solutions for the problems that he presented to us at the time. So let's start with some facts. We tested 387 AEM-based websites uh, for the Benelux region. Um, that does not mean that every website was developed here in Belgium, the Netherlands, or Luxembourg, but that means that it is available for a targeted group in Belgium, or Netherlands, or Luxembourg. For example, Mercedes is not developed here in Belgium, but you have Mercedes-Benz.be, which is an AEM website. It is, based, it is meant for Belgian audience. Every website that we tested is accessible via public URL. Uh, and we have uh, different kind of sectors that we've uh, tested, like public services, automotive, finance, media, retail, you name it, it's all in there. We came up with almost 3,000 security alerts. Um, very various things, uh, like access to a management console, access to a database query builder, uh, access to a database password for uh, an Oracle database, access to Groovy console, potentials to uh, perform code injection, XSS reflected and persistent, 
Uh, so there's many different things that came up out of this test. Uh, was that distributed across the 378 sites? Yeah. Because I wanted to clear that at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I'm not going to share those details. Um, but let's say that there were a few that had a very, very, a lot of issues, and there were a few that had none at all as well. So there are top class students, let's put it at that. And yeah, not so top class students. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, so actually, when we look at a website, we can kind of compare it to this. The top part is what we see in a website, the public facing stuff for a website. But actually, there's a lot of things when we, when we go beneath the surface that is still there, but we don't see it from the start, but it can be exploited for people who have actual knowledge about the product. So that's why this is something that really is representative for what we've done, to, for what we've done in the past few weeks. We started out looking at public websites, and then we see what can we exploit from the things that we don't immediately see when we hit their website. So why and how is this even possible? So the first thing is that AEM is a large platform and it's very complex at times as well and it could be there's just simply some security misconfiguration it could be done at dispatcher level it could be done at, at permission level on, on the publisher it could be all different kinds of things so it's just misconfiguration another topic is not installed security updates and patches every few weeks and months new hub fixes and service packs and everything get released so make sure that you're always installing those whenever you can of course when it's also in your build and release cycle of the project. It could also be a lack of knowledge or experience of the platform. Um, so if, if you start out and, and you, you buy the platform and you start developing on it, it could be that not everybody who's on your project has ha had the proper experience yet to know what the pitfalls are when it comes to AEM security. Something that also happens quite frequently is when we go from a proof of concept directly to production. Because yeah, we started out and it looks great, and yeah, that's, the business says, yeah, let's go with it. Another one is, yeah, the site might not get a lot of visitors anyway. So we start out and we start developing, and yeah, we'll put it into production, yeah, we'll see what it gives, and afterwards, we don't really care about what has happened before. Uh, we only are interested in some development, and yeah, because there's a lack of visitors, we don't care that much about security anyway. And the last one is insufficient budget allocation. So all of the budget is being spent on development, but not on security or other non-functionals. So what did we do and what didn't we do? Well, what we did is just check if certain URLs are accessible via your browser. We did not actually attempt to hack anyone at all. Um, we saw if, 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 for example, CRX was available just by typing it in your browser those kinds of things. So you won't find any logo like hacked by digitalum somewhere on the bottom of a page. No, that won't be there. Um, so rest assured, uh, we, you, you won't find something from us in any of your websites if, if you might have had a problem. But isn't it possible that you can access a page but it is blank? Uh, that could be, yeah, potentially. Potentially, yeah, indeed. So. Let's talk about AEM security out of the box. AEM comes with the no sample content run mode uh, to make it production ready. So what exactly does that mean? According to documentation, you don't have any sample content, no sample users, and no sample configuration, which is good because often these have exploits. Like for example, usernames and passwords for the re retail users are just available on the internet. So that's something that is good that is not there, so you don't have direct access with a user that you just can find by googling it. However, there are also some things there, like for example, it says CRX the e-support bundle is disabled. And actually when you start up AEM with a no sample content run mode, the bundle is not disabled, it's not properly configured. And that's something different, because you can still change the configuration to have access to the AEM repository, the JCR, by just doing a curl command and it's still active. So it's not, the what bundle itself is not disabled, it's just misconfigured from the start. The second topic is Apache, Sli Apache Sling Simple Web Dev Access to Repository is enabled on the author. But why would you want to have it enabled on the author? Because this means that there is still a potential to exploit a vulnerability. But by this, I mean you can read arbitrary files by creating your own web dev request and sending it to the server so you can still get information out of it. 
So this actually shouldn't be enabled on the author unless you specifically need it. You force the, the new users to change their password whenever they log in, except for the admin. So when you start AEM, you could be asked to define the AEM admin password for the OCI console and for uh, the JCR. The thing is, if you start AEM not with its quick start jar or with its quick start script, but just with the regular start script, which is also enabled uh, there when you unpack AEM, it's in your bin folder, <coughs> then they don't ask for a new admin password for it. It just starts up with the default credentials, admin, admin, and author, author, and replication, receiver, replication, receiver. So actually, this could mean that you still are left with the default AEM and OSGI admin, admin passwords for web consoles. Another topic is the Apache Sling GET servlet. Um, as you can see, it says that the JSON rendition is still enabled. However, the JSON rendition is the one that's being exploited the most, for example, content grabbing. So it's still enabled by default, and you can still have up to 100 different maximum results. So if you're not using the JSON rendition, just turn it off. It's as simple as that. And the 100 results, if you can still lower it, you should, you should make it match to what your application actually needs and not just leave it as a default with 100 uh, different, uh, well, well, the depth of 100 maximum results. Another thing is that, yeah, the debug generation uh, info is disabled. Uh, mapped content uh, is also uh, not using any generated debug information and the uh, DayCQ WCM filter is uh, set to author on edit, uh, is set to edit mode on author and disable on publish instance. Yeah, okay, there's nothing really special to mention here because that's good. That should be there by default. So what is still missing in my eyes? is that CRXDE should be turned off by default. The bundle should be disabled. Uh, WebDAV should also be disabled by default. And also you should always force uh, the admin password to be changed if you could log in with admin admin or author author or replication receiver replication receiver. Any of those should always be forced to change them after you log in. And also it should be nice if we have a way to define which paths could be rendered as JSON or XML. For example, if we only want our content to be rendered as JSON, we should be able to define, okay, let's have everything that starts with slash content and that is allowed to be rend rendered as a JSON, but not slash apps or slash lips or whatever, because nobody should be interested in those. We want to serve content. We don't want to serve them our own custom code. But yeah, that would probably require quite some development effort from Adobe's perspective. Some other things, other tips and tricks that you could add to your production ready mode is uh, setting the Apache Sling referrer filter to only allow requests from your specific domain. Of course, that cannot be done out of the box because every domain is different, but it should be there in some kind of run book that you have uh, to add it there as well. You should use HDL, no more JSPs, but I think most of us would probably do that because it's made to be uh, secure by design. Um, unless, of course, you use an unsafe context, but try to avoid that at all costs. Use an appropriate user for replication. Don't use admin, please, for replication. Um, and if you use replication receiver, make sure that you have the appropriate rights set to that specific user as well. Change the default password also for the replication receiver because when you start AEM, you might be asked to change your admin password and your author user <laughs> might be disabled, but your replication receiver will not be changed. And the default password for replication receiver is replication receiver. And also work with the session or the resource resolver that comes from your request. Don't necessarily open your own when you don't need to. Um, because that also has added benefit of closing automatically and you also work with the permissions coming from that specific request. So you don't open up a resource resolver with a specific user that you've created to work with your bundle and that has more permissions that you might actually want for your specific use case. So, second part in AAM security is the dispatcher, which is always done specifically for each and every individual project. AM dispatcher, what we want to get there is we want to block potentially damaging requests from hitting our AEM instances. So to do this, first of all, we want to use whitelisting instead of blacklisting. The first rule in our AEM dispatcher dot any file should be a deny of every request and then start whitelisting afterwards. 
try to ignore URL parameters as much as you can. Um, that might not always be uh, feasible for your project, but if you can, try to do it. And use extensions instead of just checking on the last part of your URL. For example, if you're going to check by anything that ends with .json by URL, there might still be exploits afterwards. But we'll get to that later on. And obviously why we want to do it is because we don't want them to have access to, for example, CRXDE, access to our apps folder, to our com folder, to our libs folder, which might contain sensitive data, login information, for example, to some, some external vendors, who knows. And we also want to block access to slash bin servlets out of the box. So I would recommend uh, if you, well, everybody has a dispatch, but that you have at least version 4.0.2, because this version will allow you to use things like uh, the extension filter, the path filter, the selector filter, instead of just using globs for everything. The first rule that you should, uh, should have is, again, a deny on every URL. And afterwards, you should allow specific methods and specific URLs to hit your AEM instances afterwards. Try to avoid globs, by the way. Um, they are being deprecated at first. Uh, that's, that's the first thing in the documentation. Uh, and they can also lead to unexpected behavior because they contain pretty much everything. So it's easy to misconfigure those. What I find a bit, an yeah, a bit annoying is that when we look at the documentation, they often still use globs as well. So that could be something that is a point of improvement as well, that you don't uh, add globs anymore in the documentation that we find on how to configure a dispatcher. Do not block just a very specific URL. Uh, make sure that you add wildcards and or use a proper combination of slash extension, slash suffix, and slash, slash path. For example, if I would have a deny on the get method that would go to slash bin slash query builder dot JSON, then the following paths would still be able to hit AEM and it would still get me this exact same results. I would still be able to get data from the query builder if I use query builder dot JSON slash A dot CSS. I would still hit the query builder or A dot ICO or add a A dot HTML because normally what we have is we have a deny on anything dot JSON, but these URLs don't end with JSON. So it will still go through the dispatcher, hit our AEM instance, and we will still potentially leak sensitive data to any hacker. So again, when we try to block on an extension, don't use it, don't do it with using a URL as done here, and it, like a star.json. So this means you can still do .json.css or .json.eco, for example. And when you, the request hits the dispatcher, it will strip the last part because you cannot have a URL with two extensions, so it will drop the last one and then forward your request still to your AEM instance with the normal JSON rendering. <coughs> That's why, us because usually what we also have is we, when we block the .json, we have another rule that says we allow anything .css. So if we use a .json.css, the request would still be able to hit our AEM instance. So a good example here would be if we have a deny and we use a path and a combination of selectors if necessary, and then also the extension. The extension is the most important part in this topic right here, because now we can know for sure that if he drops the .css or the .ico at the end, it will still block the request from hitting our AEM instance. The other tips and tricks, prevent click jacking. You can just add the header set X frame options to the same origin, to prevent click jacking. You know pretty basic way. We can prevent XSS in older browsers by adding the header set X, XSS protection set to one. We can also prevent mime type sniffing by setting X content type options to no sniff. And we can also ask the client to upgrade to SSL by using header set strict transport security with a max age, and this is like two years, I believe. And it will also include the subdomain, so if for, for our current domain, that is. Another thing is if we want to prevent CRS, CSRF attacks, we want to allow the libs granite CSRF token that JSON. And we also need to add the CSRF token header to our slash client libs section of our dispatcher.any file. It needs to be added both. <coughs> Keep in mind that if you would allow this uh, libs granite CSRF token that JSON, that does not influence anything that you've configured with the Apache get 
uh, sort of that I've talked about before. When you disable the JSON rendition, this will still work. You will still get the JSON for this specific one. <coughs> also, restrict clients that can flush your cache because we don't want everybody to be able to flush our cache, obviously. The only ones that should be able to flush our cache are the instances uh, with uh, flush agent. Mostly those are the published instances. Whenever something is published from author to publish, and we also invalidate it on our dispatchers. And we also want to limit the cacheable URLs uh, using filters to prevent DOS attacks on our dispatcher. Um, so what we don't want to do is we want to cache some common things like HTML files, JPEG files, PDF files, but not some exotic types because, yeah, you don't know what, it, what a hacker is trying to do. Um, so you, you want to prevent that uh, by just making sure that those specific requests are not being cached afterwards. Uh, you also want to run penetration tests uh, with different kinds of tools. There's not one go-to tool for everything, of course. Um, you can use things like Nmop, for example. Um, and also the last thing, which is also quite important, is we want to prevent content grabbing. Why do we want to prevent content grabbing? That's because often what we see is that content grabbing will allow you to get, for example, some sensitive data like email addresses from content authors or uh, some configuration that was set on your home page, for example. So we want to prevent that from happening. Now, how can we prevent content grabbing? What we can do is we can add a deny and we can add these specific selectors. Everything you see here, by the way, can be found in the documentation on dispatcher configuration on Adobe's website. So we want to deny these specific selectors and we want to deny also the specifically the JSON and XML extension as those are the ones that can leak a, a large bunch of data at the same time. Uh, and the second part is we want to also then if you want to do it specifically on slash content, for example, we can do it on a deny with a path slash content. We add some different kinds of selectors there as well. The feed and RSS are the ones that are also frequently abused when it comes to uh, content grabbing. And also the infinity and the tidy ones, the tidy selectors, <coughs> they're also quite often used for that. And we want to again block using the JSON, XML, and even HTML extension to just make sure that we have everything. So we've now discussed how we, how we can basically configure some things on AEM itself, on a dispatcher, but we also need to make sure that we can do it on a development level. Because development could lead to severe loopholes. Um, so when, what's really important here is that we don't develop potential backdoors. For example, we, we don't develop endpoints that can leak data because we might not know what a hacker is trying to do. Um, and if we do make something like this to leak some data, make sure that it can only access specific parts of your data and not your whole JCR, for example. Also, watch out with third-party code, for example, AEM fill and a Groovy console, because they are not secure by default. And uh, you have the potential that it could be remote code execution, um, which could be very damaging to your system uh, and could even take down your complete website or could completely... Uh, override whatever your website is currently looking like. Anything could be done whenever you are, have access to AEM Fiddle or the Groovy Console. The Groovy Console would allow you to um, execute Unix code on the machine itself via your own browser, which is a bit insane. So, there is quite simple. Do not ever use AEM Fiddle in production. We have found cases of people of, of websites basically that have AM fiddle product in, ready and enabled in production that we managed to access without doing anything. We just went to the URL, that's it. And you could just execute any code you wanted. So we also informed those people that, yeah, you have, you have a problem here, please fix this as soon as possible. Um, and luckily they did. So the second part is also the Groovy console. Um, Quite a, there were a lot more who had the Groovy Console enabled an AEM fiddle. Um, this means that on every one of those websites, we were able to execute Unix shell commands just via our own browser. Also work with the session again on a sync request to make sure that the rights are there for the specific user so that you don't actually uh, by accident take, open up a new session with an admin user and then start fetching data from your JCR. Just use the one from the request, which is mostly anonymous unless you allow them to log in first on your website. 
and also try to avoid the unsafe context in your HDL, uh, also to prevent XSS, XSS attacks. Could be both from the inside of your company, but also from outside of your company. Okay, so um, we want to give you a quick overview of the most common issues that we found on those 387 websites. So the first one was we were able to create JCR nodes via the post servlet, which would allow us to create persistent XSS or remote code execution. 83 out of, out of those 387 websites had the post servlet just uh, exposed to us, or to, to, to basically to everyone. The second one is CRXDE was exposed. Now, that's, that basically boils down to what I said before. Often what you see is they have a uh, deny on slash CRX slash DE slash index.jsp and then it stops. But if you do dot JSP dot CSS, for example, you will still be able to hit it and you would still get access to CRXDE. 85 of the 387 were, were able to access CRXDE, which is quite a huge number, seeing as what the damage you can do in CRXDE. Number eight, uh, we have reflected XSS via SWF. Um, so the DOM and AEM has some endpoints that expose SWF and they can be vulnerable to reflected XSS as that is executed in your browser as well. So if some malicious person would want to add some things in the URL and then send that over to potential victims, then they would have reflected XSS because of whatever is there inside the URL. Number seven, the WCM debug filter was exposed. Um, again, what we also have here is that there could be reflected XSS. Um, there's actually a very nice uh, topic about this uh, created uh, because they had an issue at Philips with this. Um, so if you have some spare time, read through it. It's really interesting to read um, if you're into some security stuff. Um, number six, the login status servlet is exposed. This means that we could potentially brute force passwords because we can just keep on hitting this and whenever we actually guess or brute force the correct password, then it will say we have authenticated with that specific user. And if we're not being, if we're not, if we don't guess the right password, then we would say authentication is false. So whenever it says something else and false, then we know that we have the correct password. Number five, the user info servlet, which is basically the same as the one before, the login status servlet, uh, which we can also use to potentially brute force passwords. And then number four is also another one of those, which is the current user servlet, um, which we can also use to potentially brute force passwords as they all expose the current user that you have with your request. So as long as it always says false or you, or you don't get the username, then you know that you don't have the right one. Once you see that you have admin for example that you know you have guessed or brute forced the admin password what we see though is that if you can see it 127 and 128 different instances is that they always it was pretty much always the same uh, three that were always exposed for the same website so it was once you had one most nine times out of ten you would have all three of them exposed number three is the query builder feed servlet this would allow you to uh, get some sensitive data potentially from the JCR because you can just query the complete data, the, the complete JCR and get data out of it. And this would be in a RSS feed format. And then number two is again also the query builder JSON servlet, which is the same as a feed servlet, except this time you get it as a JSON format instead of a uh, RSS feed format. And again, pretty much the same numbers here except for a few. Um, because yeah, if they don't have one, they don't, also don't have blocked the other one. And then comes number one, the pole server itself is exposed, uh, which will allow us to have persistent XSS or RCE. And there were 185 instances, me meaning that it's pretty much half of all the tested websites had this server exposed. So we could potentially inject our own nodes into the JCR and send over links to those nodes to users and could have some XSS uh, problems with the victims. So enough of that. Let's have a bit of a closer look at what we found and how it looks like and how easy it actually was also to find some sensitive data. 
So what you see here is what we, first of all, we chose There was no specific reason why we chose um, Just a random pick. It shouldn't start. Well, I'll just click here. So what we found out is that the apps folder was exposed, uh, meaning that we could access it via a triple slash apps.json slash a.css. So if we then will go to our browser and say, okay, let's see what we can find here. Go here. And one of the frequent use selectors could be the children list, which is used here. So we can see what children are beneath that specific apps folder. And then we start looking at what is being custom. So we're not really interested in, for example, foundation or CQ, but the PPN is something that is custom. So that's why we looked at PPN. And is it stop now or? Oh, okay. okay, so there we go. And then we also had a configuration for production publish. <coughs> and then again, use the children list. And there you can see we have the configuration for a JDBC pool, which is an Oracle database. And there you have a username, a password, and a connection string to an Oracle database. So that could be how easy it is to just leak sensitive data. It, that literally took one minute to find out. So keep in mind that security is really important in these kinds of matters. Some other exhibits, some screenshots. Um, I'm not sure if everybody knows. Um, they had the Groovy console opened which means that we were able to do a cut of slash etc slash pass wd uh, and this would allow us to just find all the users that have ever logged in into that machine we could also if we wanted to just shut down AEM uh, just doing a, a pseudo service AEM stop if, if that is the case um, because yeah these are all run under the AEM user with the user permissions of, of which the AEM process is running the second one, uh, we were able to just DDoS basically their servers uh, over and over again. Uh, because yeah, if you have to go to 50,000 or more nodes every time and just refresh a few times, then yeah, you're easily going to overload the system. Dot com, um, yeah, they had access just to CRXDE and you could even log in with a Wii retail user there. So yeah, should never be the case. and. Be, they also had CRX DE exposed, not with re re retail, but yeah, again, this, this is something that is, should always be blocked, regardless of whatever your project is. This should never be enabled. But keep in mind, uh, you might not know all of these, these brands, these domains, but it's not only the small guys. It's also, for example, .com, which is used for your hotmail and everything. You could just add... Well, you used to be able to just add question mark.css after it's slash system slash console, and you could be able to log into the OSGI management console. Of com. And another one is also running AEM, and you can still access even to this date, unfortunately, uh, their query builder using this path, for example, using .server.css, and then add whatever you want to it, and you can still query their, their JCR. So this is a Belgian uh, player in the Be Belgian finance sector, which we were able to log in in the, their uh, old content repository, ex uh, content explorer. Just change the login button to log into your account. Yeah, and if we wanted, we could have just deleted everything, which of course we did not do. Uh, we notified them about it. We just took some screenshots. That's it. <laughs> so yeah. It goes to say that things like this should always be blocked again, over and over. Um, there are some things out there on the Adobe website to help you with some security checklists. Uh, so for example, uh, one for AEM and one for the dispatcher more specifically. Um, but keep in mind that whatever I said today, use an extension, don't always use URL, don't 
try to prevent using globs in your dispatcher. Use the correct user permissions always. Uh, try to use the resource resolvers and, and the session from the current request that is coming in. Don't just open your own resource resolver all the time. Um, those are just some, some easy things to follow up on and then your website would always be a lot more secure. Also, um, very recently there has been uh, a new vulnerability that has been listed. Uh, so if your system is using SAML and you have been using AEM 6.4 or 6.5, make sure to use the latest uh, security update for AEM as you would be able to execute uh, your code without having to know the admin password as an admin user if you use the SAML integration for AEM. Um, so this has been very recently, as you can see, in August of this year, has it been flagged and it has been, uh, the, the security patch has been rolled out, I think in September, if I'm not mistaken. So make sure that you take this and you apply it to your systems as soon as possible, because everybody knows about this now, and especially the hackers do. So we have reached the end. Um, do any of you still have any questions?